I'm Shani Prucci. Uh, today we're going to be talking about testing against the OWASP ASVS, talking a little bit about the purpose behind it. Um, really, this, this all came from a little bit of a rant I went on when I, was, uh, when I learned that Google wanted to start testing web applications against the ASVS, and uh, organizations started asking for that, and uh, me wanting to make sure that they knew what they were getting themselves into. Uh, like I said at the beginning, a love for Princess Bride is not a strict prerequisite, but will enjoy how much you uh, will increase how much you enjoy this talk. So what we're going to go through today, uh, introduce myself briefly, I'm going to talk about really what the ASVS is, uh, what it's meant to be used for, talk about what exactly is involved when you're testing against the ASVS, go into a deep dive of the requirements, and then talk about the uh, part of testing which I find most difficult, which is testing against infrastructure-based requirements, and then introduce to you the technical guide uh, that is available for download that goes through every single one of the 200 and something requirements in the ASVS uh, and tells you basically what type of access you need to test it. Uh, so Inigo, Inigo Montoya has perfected the uh, introduction. He you know, knows that you should start with a polite greeting, give your name, a relevant personal link, and manage expectations. If I were to follow his, uh, his introduction method, uh, good morning, I'm Shani. You're currently attending my talk about testing against the ASVS standard and prepare to learn uh, and hopefully enjoy it enough to give a green card at the end. That being said, uh, I'm not as good as uh, Inigo is in, in introduction, so I'll, I'll have to use my own version. Uh, I'm an offensive security consultant at Bishop Fox. I specialize in AppSec, uh, mainly application security testing, threat modeling, and uh, architecture security assessments. I also do some uh, tabletop incident response exercises, which draws on my past experience doing enterprise information security, lots of incident response, uh, and some GRC stuff. I live near Philly, so I took the uh, Northeast Regional Amtrak Trail Line, if anyone is uh, a fan of that. Um, my favorite movie is The Princess Bride. If you haven't been able to tell, it's in a, a pretty close tie with Back to the Future. Can thank my dad's obsessions for that. Uh, and since we're in DC, I have to call out my favorite museums. Uh, not in DC proper, uh, but out by Dulles Airport is the Udvar Hazy Center. It's an extension of the air and space. They have an SR-71, which is the most beautiful machine to ever grace this planet. Uh, as well as the Enola Gay and a space, sta uh, space shuttle. Uh, wonderful. If you can get out there, highly recommend it. Better than the air and space itself, although that might be heresy. Okay, so I want to provide a, a short break uh, background to the ASVS before we you know, jump into the deep end. Oh, and I should mention I sit on the ASVS working group. Uh, so I'm, I'm not just some random uh, who's, who's spouting off about it, although I will say me getting on the working group was a result of this work. Uh, so before, before this, I was just some random who was ranting about the ASVS. Um, so going on some basics, the ASVS is the Application Security Verification Standard. It was first published in 2008. We're currently in version four. Uh, version five is bleeding edge. You can access it on GitHub, but it's not, uh, it's, it's kind of still going through a bunch of reorganizations. So version four is uh, kind of, if, if you want something that's not gonna change too much, uh, we recommend following that. Version five will be published eventually. Um, it is an open standard and it lists 278 controls across 14 verification topics. So those verification topics are architecture design and threat modeling, authentication, session management, access control, validation, sanitiz validation sanitization and encoding, stored cryptography, error handling and logging, data protection, communication, malicious code, business logic, 
files and resources, API and web services, and configuration. These controls, each control is associated with a, an assurance level. So you have assurance levels, levels one, two, and three. Level one is the most basic. Basically, it says this is the bare minimum. Every application should follow this. And it can be tested entirely with penetration testing, but a little asterisk near that because there are actually 20 um, ver uh, verification requirements that can't be tested with pen testing. Um, so little, little asterisk there. Level two is recommended for most applications. Um, these are applications that you need to authenticate to access, may have semi-sensitive data, uh, but not uh, infrastructure critical stuff. And level three is this is the highest level of security that you need. This is critical applications. This uh, deals with medical information. This has access to your water supply. Uh, if this gets hacked, we are um, in, in big trouble. So in the ASVS standard, they also uh, explain what is the intended usage of this. So there's two main usage. First, to aid in the development and maintenance of secure applications. So really, it's meant for the devs to follow, to have a guide. Here's all of the things that you need to be able to check off. And also for vendors to be able to you know, standardize and align their offerings and say, here is what we offer for the, you know, to be able to ensure the security of your applications and for the buyers to be able to kind of set their expectations. But there's other uses that they also outline in the standard, which is using it as a resource for training devs on uh, secure development, uh, as guidance for secure architecture, a secure coding checklist, which kind of feeds back into the training for secure development, as well as secure software procurement. So if you, are, if you want to make sure that the software that you're buying is secure, you can also run through a checklist as well. Um, but we also see folks test against, uh, basically use it as a guide for penetration testing. Uh, just as we have organizations that used to and still do, much to my dismay, ask that Penetrate that we penet uh, do penetration testing against the OWASP top 10. That can be a whole other rant. I cannot test. There are, there are sections in the OWASP top 10, like logging, where if I confirm that you are testing that, that is a whole other finding called information disclosure. I do not want to confirm that you are properly logging. Um, so what does it mean when an organization asks can, can you do ASVS testing? And the fact that they're asking for it is a good thing, right? Because it means that they want to be able to test against something. We don't really have a regulatory framework for straight AppSec. If an organization is, is bound by HIPAA, that's great. And when they say we want HIPAA testing, basically it means if I can access, you know, PHI, then you failed. Uh, and for PCI, there are a few more, uh, you know, standard requirements as far as network segmentation. But again, nothing really set in stone for straight up application security. So them knowing to ask to test against ASVS is definitely a step ahead, uh, especially because the alternative is testing against the OWASP top 10. Um, so this is definitely preferable. And we see that there's actually now um, programs being created around testing against the ASVS. Primarily, we have the Application Defense Alliance, which is spearheaded by Google. Uh, this is CASA and MASA. Um, CASA is for uh, your typical web apps. MASA is for mobile applications. Um, and this basically is a requirement that any application that is hosted on Google Play uh, or leverages Google resources. So like if you have an extension that leverages Google Mailbox, uh, like if you're using Google Mail and it wants to add things into your calendar or automate responses or anything like that, they need to follow CASA or MASA. And you also have the CREST OWASP verification standard, which this is not actually to test individual applications but it's an accreditation for app 
security testing companies to show that they have the ability to test against levels one and two of the ASVS and the MASVS, which is the mobile a, uh, version of the ASVS. And when you say test against levels one and two, we said earlier that level one is completely penetration testable, uh, minus the 20 requirements that are not. Level two gets a little bit stickier, and that's where I want to focus on. So when I say completely verif uh, verified with penetration testing, right, uh, there's, there's these 20 requirements that aren't quite, and you actually need documentation if you want to verify those, and that's stuff like cryptography, uh, and it explicitly says in the standard that this is level one, but you can't actually test for it if, if you're just testing against level one. Level two and three, by definition, uh, require access to documentation, secure code, configuration, and the people involved in the development process. What this looks like depends on how much you trust your developers. Um, really what counts is evidence. And that matters on what's the purpose of the test. Is this an internal test that you just want to make sure everything's on the up and up? Is this something that you need to hand over to your customers? Is this something that you are in deep trouble and you need to show that you are doing something right? And more importantly, do you trust your documentation that that's accurate against what is actually happening? And do you trust the developers and the documentation? This matters because there are cases where you may interview the developers and they tell you one thing, and it may not be malicious that what they are telling you is not in line with what is in actuality. Usually it's not malevolent. They are not intentionally lying to you, but the design can be different from the implementation. And so if you don't trust your developers and your documentation, what do you trust? You trust maybe screenshots, maybe, because those can be faked pretty easily. So you trust giving the testers access to all of your systems. Anything that you would ask a developer for or a member of the infrastructure team, hey, how are you storing your data? Is that encrypted? Well, now I need AWS keys. And, and that's great. AWS actually has a permissions level specifically to look at the security configuration, but not every single service does. And so now you need your infrastructure and your network team to be able to approve either your security team, or in my case, I'm treated as a contractor by those companies. So you need to then give them approval and the account set up. And that's just adding more time. If you're using an external team, more money, um, and probably sending a laptop out to whoever's doing the testing. And that might just double your cost. Um, all that being said, what is there to do, right? Because there's some companies that they need those infrastructure requirements tested. All the things that you can only get with documentation or interviewing the developers, or if you don't trust them, straight up accessing dashboards, some of them require that. So we need to determine how we verify each requirement, right? Because we can't just say, oh, I can do some of them. Uh, companies generally want to know exactly what and what not you're, you'll be testing. Um, the numbers that I'm going to be throwing at you in the next few slides reflect 273 requirements of the 278 that are in current uh, version 4.0, Point three, I think uh, five that are missing are 100% uh, definitely being deleted in version five or being merged, um, which was a huge relief to me because when I was breaking down every single requirement, I reached out to 
uh, some of the authors of the ASVS, and I was like, hey, I don't quite understand this. And they said, us neither, we're actually getting rid of it for version five. It was a huge relief. So I broke down every single requirement and figured out what do you actually need to be able to verify it? And I found that 147 of the requirements are completely penetration testable. Uh, some of these are, uh, you know, it, looking down just by the level, 147 are level one, 109 are level two, and 17 are level three. Remember, level three is this like highest level of security that's really for uh, mission critical applications. But this doesn't tell you what you actually need to test them. So let's break it down. Um, there's some level two and level three that we can uh, test with penetration testing. Uh, 16 in level two, almost less than, than three in level three. Uh, for level two, we need quite a bit of access to source code, uh, which is not difficult usually to get access to, whether they put it in a zip file and send it over to you or give you access to their, uh, to, to their GitHub. Usually this is not an issue for, for clients to, to give you. Level two has some that require uh, documentation and we'll go into that in a little bit. We also have these infrastructure based requirements, whether it's straight infrastructure or infrastructure and source code or infrastructure and documentation or source code and documentation. I don't really, you know, we don't really know what this infrastructure level access is quite yet, but that's the uh, further deep dive of this. So what are the observations just from these basic numbers? 80% of all of the requirements can be verified through hybrid testing, meaning penetration testing plus source code. For most applications and most uses, this should be enough. You, you really should not need full on documentation and developer or infrastructure access. All of the 11 documentation based requirements that we saw in level two, all of those are in the architecture design and threat modeling chapter. That happens to be my favorite chapter because I specialize in application architecture and threat modeling. Um, but for the most part, you won't have to worry about application, uh, about that documentation. And the top two chapters for infrastructure based requirements are the architecture design and threat modeling chapter and the stored cryptography chapter. Uh, we do have requirements, uh, those infrastructure based requirements in other chapters, but we'll go into that. Uh, so what does it mean when we say infrastructure based? It means involving more people in your testing, giving people more work and actually opening up the attack surface because as, as you give permissions to more people, you have more opportunities for a breach. So let's look at the access types. When we talk about infrastructure based testing, this is the infrastructure we're talking about. And this is from going through, again, every single one of these verification requirements. I'm not just listing every type of piece of infrastructure that exists in an enterprise, although it may look like that. We need access to the key management system, user and group permissions, your logging solutions, your SIEM, your source code control system, your CI CD pipeline, your network config, data storage config, load balancer, so much more. I don't even wanna know how many teams I would need to get permissions from, and it probably increases uh, with the size of the company because you, know, you may be lucky and only have to deal with a network and infrastructure team, but as the company is more tech oriented and has a larger tech team, that becomes more granular and you now are looking at like 20 people to give you permission for this access. So can we at least like pare this down is, is the question. And yes, if we group the verification requirements by the access necessary, we can easily test over half of the infrastructure requirements uh, if we only worry about um, the storage solution and uh, the CI CD system, right? So 
mind you, infrastructure-based requirements are only 13% of the total requirements in the, in the ASVS, right? We said that we can test 80% of the ASVS with solely source code and penetration testing. Um, I say infrastructure based is only 13% of requirements because there are some requirements um, that you know we need straight up documentation for. That's not something that you're going to get with infrastructure at all. Uh, and that's mainly surrounding the design of the application, which you need design documents for that. So, like I said, this was the result of uh, a whole bunch of work uh, combing through every single one of the requirements and figuring out what you actually needed to test it. Um, and the time that I spent combing through all of these requirements was not just to come up with all these numbers. I also created a technical guide with every single one of the requirements, defining, defining the necessary access for testing each requirement when you're in a case of you need true verification. Um, that can be downloaded with this QR code. It's a zip file. Um, I promise there's, there's nothing malicious in there. I do work for an offensive security firm, but I promise there's no, nothing malicious in there. You, know, you get warned, don't you know, scan the weird QR codes. Uh, you, you can scan the weird QR code. Um, this is published on my employer's blog. Um, and I put a lot of work and love and maybe a few tears into it. Uh, it does also have some of the conclusions that are discussed in this talk, uh, just about, uh, you know, that you can get a whole bunch done without testing against infrastructure and why do we talk about infrastructure testing and what are the cases where this is worthwhile. Uh, so it, it is in addition to like having the straight up breakdown. Um, so, you know, you may see some repeated content. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, one of the benefits of being one of the first talks of the day is that I get to tell you, uh, have fun storming the castle. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, my love for Princess Bride definitely came from my dad. And we still get told, like, if we're about to, you know, go to a party or do something like that or, you know, have fun, have fun storming the castle. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Um, and if you have questions after reading the guide, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or um, my email is, uh, I think should be on the blog um, or you know my LinkedIn as well is totally fair game. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm also part of the ASVS working group. So if you like me have any rants about the ASVS, you can come to the working group. Uh, Josh Grossman, who's one of the authors, uh, leaders of the ASVS, uh, and is one of the reasons uh, I got involved in this and um, has been super helpful in this. Uh, he is not here today, uh, but I'm sure he's also more than happy to listen to your rants. And even better, because the ASVS is an open standard, go to the GitHub open issues, contribute. We always love more contributions. And every time someone opens an issue, we get to respond to it and have a discussion about it. My most recent favorite one was, do we need an ASVS for LLMs? My answer is I really hope not. Um, although we do definitely need to talk about how applications are uh, integrating with LLMs because I've seen a few too many applications want to just grab code straight from LLMs and, you know, remote code execution as a service is, is always great. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yep. Um, question on the evidence. Yeah. Because obviously you mentioned things like uh, screenshots and the date. Yeah. Right? But I had a problem with a source code, which was kind of a pain because for that to happen, developer fixed the vulnerability and they removed the hard-coded password inside the uh, source code repo, and that was not an option which was deployed to production. They push that. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> um, I think your solution there is 
if there's, you know, if you then are able to access their CI CD pipeline as part of the infrastructure, that's something you can confirm. Honestly, other than like trusting that, was, was that malicious, like intentional or just an act? Because I've had it happen by accident. That's one of the many tricks. Yeah, no, and, and there, that is part of the level of trust you need to have, I think, and always worth asking, especially when you're you know, doing remediation-based testing, when, when it's like, oh, we, we fixed it. But like, on, on what level did you fix it? So I don't have statistics on that, but given that all of level one can be done through manual and automated pen testing, I'll guess maybe 50% of that can be done automated. Um, I'd say maybe like, 40%, but that's off the top of my head, so don't quote me on that. The MASVS has a lot more guidance on specific test cases than the ASVS currently does. Um, that's something that if you join the ASVS working group, we can add. Um, but I know that that's something that's definitely like we want to add more about specific test cases but probably between the things that require source code access, because you, know, you could definitely add that to some of the, test, to the unit tests um, and things that could be addressed with, with automated pen testing. So I'd say maybe 40% total, which would probably look like 60% of level one and two. Yep. Yeah, so definitely there is overlap with some of the testing guide um, because the testing guide is going to address, you know, some of the common stuff that you are testing for in, uh, you know, when you're looking at the ASVS, right? Like ASVS is looking at input sanit sanitization, verification, and coding, right? So like that's going to make sure that you're not ending up with cross-site scripting or SQL injection or no SQL injection or, you know, all of the different languages that exist these days. But that's going to make sure that you're not ending up with any of the input-based uh, uh, vulnerabilities. And so obviously there's going to be layover there with the testing guide. Right now I don't believe that there is um, mapping in the ASVS specifically for what's in the testing guide. There is mapping against uh, CVE uh, not CVE, CWE. the CWE, thank you. There is mapping currently against the CWE. I don't know, the testing guide may also map against the CWE. Against, uh, the yes, for, uh, yeah, um, but there's no direct mapping, but there definitely will be overlap with that. Thank you for answering the question, yeah. You asked my pet question. <laughs> so, um, like I mentioned, what I do the most and enjoy the most is threat modeling and uh, architecture review. And I use uh, almost exclusively chapter one, which is the application design, threat modeling, and 
uh, architecture security chapter for that. Um, at my organization, we took and slightly modified chapter one. Um, there were a few requirements that we tossed out because we felt that they were more implementation based than design based. Um, we brought in some more requirements. So I brought in a few requirements on like session handling because I felt that there wasn't anything really addressed there um, in, in chapter one for session handling. So I brought in some requirements just from elsewhere in the ISVS. I didn't create new requirements, just pulled in from elsewhere. The things I got rid of um, were things like the uh, business logic that that's really like impl implementation based. Um, merged some of the encoding stuff, um, but I use that almost exclusively, especially for architecture reviews. For threat modeling, I found that it informs a lot of my interviews with, um, with developers, and so I can definitely use that chapter as kind of a checklist for making sure that I asked all the right questions. Um, I'm in the practice of asking those questions as open answer and not is yes, no, because I want to elicit as many details as possible from the developer. Um, so instead of asking, do you do this? I'll ask, how do you do this? Um, my secret to the end of those interviews as well is what did I not ask about that you think I should know? That gets you all of the secrets spilled. That gets you the, oh yeah, we have this document that has like all of the dev passwords and clear text. Oh, and, and by the way, the, the prod database is uh, copied and that's the dev database too. So like <laughs> all of that prod data exists there. And also like we kind of have like an internal company that like shouldn't access that, that prod data. Um, so it definitely shouldn't be used as dev data. Um, that's, that's when you get all, all the juicy information. But yeah, that's, I definitely find that that has been most useful when doing high level, you know, um, architecture review and especially as guiding questions for threat modeling. I won't use it as a checklist for threat modeling only because, um, you know, with that I care a little bit less about meeting like controls in a checkoff way and more in like I'll I'll treat that later when I'm accessing uh, mitigations if threats I find are mitigated but more as a guide for the questions that I should be asking. There are always a few more questions I find that I have when I'm doing threat modeling specifically in trying to establish some of those data flows that I wouldn't um, necessarily ask when doing an, an architecture review, um, but it definitely is a great baseline and the changes that I've made have really been like less than five and something that has been the result of experience and just, I ended up asking those questions because over time I've learned that you can't take certain things for granted. Like, you know that not all websites that you have to log into have a logout button because I assumed that they would. Um, learned that the hard way. Um, so that's something that has been changed a little over time, but is still very much recognizable as chapter one. More than happy. Um, I just kind of wanted, so my management wanted me to be using, actually just starting out with, what we already use on, right? Because we don't have any aspects to build a good product at all. Yeah. I mean, they never built anything below, like, all of the new standards of those things. So, um, my management, though, wants a cushion for developers I think that that's something that you can do as an extension of a use of the ASVS as a secure coding guide. 
if the developers are doing compliance testing, but they're the same developers who maybe, hopefully, were the ones who developed the application, or at least intimately familiar with it, um, then they, you know, because they are not newcomers to the code, and they're not viewing the code uh, as solely compliance folks, they should be able to go through also level two, to be quite honest, um, and know if it's compliant or not, because hopefully they wrote the code against it. Um, although you are you know, going to have playbooks because the, 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 the requirements are sometimes a little bit vague and, and they're meant to be. Um, they're meant to kind of cover the whole gamut and not, not to mention that some of the requirements are going to look different in different languages. Um, and so how that looks secure coded is going to look different per language, per organization, per use case. But I definitely see uh, how you can overlap compliance testing with the secure coding checklist if it's the same devs. How did you guys solve it? So my response to my management was, I'm not sure that it makes a lot of sense because number one, compliance testing is not the same as vulnerability testing, right? And they, they have extensions you equate the two. Um, number two, it's not binary. It's not a yes or no to compliance. You could have things like, for instance, outflow coding where 75% of the stuff is outflow coding and not 25%. So how do you grade that, right? Is that compliant or not? Yeah. Um, you also have cases where you just may have whole strings, like for instance, <coughs> if you don't have a, a REST or a SOAP API, right, that whole section goes away and it's just not applicable. Yeah. So from those perspectives, I think that it doesn't make sense. And, and, and I just said, we should just find, we should just focus on finding vulnerabilities first. Yeah, and I definitely, um, I mean, definitely the conflating compliance with, with vulnerability testing is a struggle. Um, one thing I'll tell you that I personally do when testing um, against ASVS is I keep a column of notes and that's where I'll put if it's partial. Uh, and I actually, if, if I, I have a column that goes, you know, meets, doesn't meet, and then I have NA and I have partial, where partial is like, you have some stuff that's missing, but like you're halfway there. Um, and that way I can call out later in findings saying, hey, like you're, you're actually like pretty close there, but you're missing some stuff. Um, and that's able to give them the confidence that like, yeah, you're doing something right, but you may be missing a few cases or you, you got half the way there, but you're missing uh, some, some other parts. The thing, too, that I thought we could do instead is, like, when we find things in SAS or DAS or pen testing and we cite vulnerabilities, um, then we could say we need to review this for the ASVS requirements. Yeah. Yeah, and, and tie it back to like, here's what, what you're missing. No, that's a great approach. Any other questions? Yep. So, Bruce, quite, you mentioned vendors using the ASVS. I guess bigger vendors like the Big Bad Snake that are built into the Big Snake that you pull out. There's a lot of these new OWASP apps that are introduced to the Big Snake. To my knowledge, I don't know of any vendors currently doing it. Um, vendors with what, like PWD, and you could go to single record. Backward map. Um, that you could backward map. I, I will say, we, as far as product vendors, no, there are, I mean, Crest now has um, the accreditation, and so service vendors can. Um, you can always ask a service vendor uh, if they're testing against it, but to my knowledge, no SaaS, DAS vendor is currently advertising that. Um, what I will say is the MASVS has a lot clearer test cases, and so I wouldn't be surprised if we see vendors addressing the MASVS before we see them addressing the ASVS. But that's just speculation. Any more questions? Yeah? <laughs>
one of the things that I found out is that you mentioned right that some of the things they say, and that was like one of the top common complaints that we have about like our standards, right? That it's ambiguous, right? So we're trying to fill fill in that those details. But so what happens is I, instead of like using the standard pay it with it fund, I have to customize it to say, you know, like we only want people to use certain output equations for this language, right? Or we want to, you know, use certain traffic standards, right? We don't want them to consider like a, you know, find the text bubble of the traffic standards, right? So, you know, we we make things very specific where like the, the source of photography one is just one view that's like immediately comes to mind. So it doesn't mention any type of fee, it doesn't really men mention any tag fee or anything. So you have to fill in details there. Have they ever thought about kind of like, I don't know, parameterizing certain requirements that you could kind of like fill it in with your parameters as opposed to, you know, um, having to go back and just completely customize it? Yeah, um, to be honest, I don't know if that's been considered. It definitely hasn't been dis discussed quite yet, but I'm pretty new to the working group. Um, I think part of it is it would be quite a bit of work to fully parameter parameterize it, just given the sheer number of cases um, that, that you're gonna see the difference. And that is the relative ease that is offered to the authors of the ASVS is that we're not addressing every single case where it's used uh, because we can, or, because we're not using language specific language or case specific language, we're able to just say like use out proper output encoding and assuming you know that you know what it means for proper output encoding, which well, is yeah, kind of the complaint. Aspect groups generally do. Developers generally don't. Yeah, and and they need more of the guidance there. Um, like I said, that's more of a something that you'd see more in the M A the M A S V S with use cases that we're, we haven't quite gotten there with the ASVS just because there's a lot fewer people involved and a lot less de demand for it. Um, and so hopefully that's something that will come in an evolution of V5, but first V5 needs to be um, solidified and not just bleeding edge. So thank you everyone. Um, if you have any question, more questions, you can find me. Um, and please don't forget to do, your, do the, the tickets survey at the back. Um, thank you all for coming out.